just the way things go, right? Man, it's good to see everybody here today. Man, what a packed house. Woo! That is good stuff. Hey, you know what? We, we're going to do things a little bit different uh, today. And I was thinking about that earlier. I thought, you know what? I'm going to get up and I'm going to once again say that we're going to do things a little bit different. But here's the thing. If I keep saying that every week, then I'm not sure that it's different. I think it's just just is, right? I mean, if I just, every time you show up, there's something different, then it just is. <clears throat> we are getting ready to enter into the Christmas season, which is my favorite time of the year. I love this time of the year. I don't know how many of you put your trees up, but I finally got my tree up. Uh, actually, it was up about a week ago, and, and the lights on the house went up th- today, so I'm really excited about that as well. So I love this time of the year. I love being able to celebrate Christ's birth, but also as we kind of slide into December, this is our opportunity to also talk about missions. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. All of the proceeds, all of the monies that are raised, all the monies that you give, they go directly to the work on the international stage. So in other words, it goes overseas to help our missionaries overseas to be able to continue to do what it is that they do. So today, we are. I'm going to take advantage of two things. One... Luke Wheeler, can I call you Luke or Lucas? I, I, I keep, I keep on, which, which do you prefer? Really doesn't matter to me. So. It doesn't matter. No, okay. Doesn't matter All right. How about one. mom? Mom doesn't matter to you. It doesn't matter to you either. Okay. So we have Luke Wheeler here and Luke just re- returned from a mission trip. And then also we have David and his family and they are missionaries over in South Asia. So today we're going to spend just a little bit of time. I'm going to interview Luke because Luke just returned from a mission trip. And then we'll, we'll take a little bit of a five-minute break there. And then David's going to come up and he's going to share. So I'm really excited about that. He's going to share a little bit about what God's kind of laid on his heart. And he's going to stay with the theme that we're, we've been in, you know, the, the uh, love is all you need. So he, he's going he's to kind of take that piece and move with it. So that'll be excellent. So, Luke, I am glad that you're here. And, and can I just share with you, your mom was so excited on Sunday. She came up to me. She was just, oh, he's, he's almost home. He's almost home. You know, her, her baby was overseas. And that was pretty, pretty difficult. So tell us a little bit about where you went. Well, I went to uh, uh, Nairobi, Kenya, if anybody knows where that is. It's down on the southeastern part of Africa, right near the horn. It kind of looks like a rhino's horn, if you look at it. That's why it's called the horn. Um, but um, so we went there for a missions trip to work at African Nazarene University which I'm sporting one of their vests here today. <laughs> and, um, but we didn't go there straight from Seattle. That would be a long trip. 14 hours in a plane was sucky enough. Um, so me and 40 others, so there were 41 of us, we went to, uh, in a 14-hour plane ride, all the way to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, if you don't know, that's like the second richest country in the world under America. Uh, we, me and a few others put together this joke about Dubai that when you went there, you'd see millionaires begging on the side of the road for an extra dollar because the people there are so rich. Um, so we stayed there for the night and that was, um, it was pretty crazy. See people driving around in sports cars and wearing rubies all over the place, like diamond rings that are that big. Um, (laughs) not really. Um, um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you did. What, what did you do when you actually arrived and, you know, what was the purpose of the mission trip? Well, the purpose of the mission trip was to go to African Nazarene University and serve where we were needed, which in my case was demolition of one of their dorm rooms, or not dorm rooms, dorm buildings, so that they could rebuild it, make it, so that they could have m- have more people there, have more students, therefore have more money to build things. And okay, so so in other words, they were going to demolish something so that they could rebuild and, and have more more room for more students. Is that yeah, kind of that's oh cool. that's what it was. So you got to destroy things. Yeah, that I <laughs> like those kind of mission trips. Those are those are the good ones. Whenever you can, you know, knock things down. I've I've got so many projects at my house where I just tore things apart, but I haven't put it back together. So you didn't have to do any of the put back together stuff. We actually did. We had to put in electrical conduit through through the walls, and I mean, these walls were cinder block, so they were that thick, and they were solid with con- concrete poured through the middle of them. 
So we had to break through cinder block concrete and then cinder block again. We had to go through till we could see the other guy on the other side <laughs> so that we could put in this electrical conduit for the uh, plug-ins and stuff. All right. So tell me this, because I know that, that you, you had an opportunity to be there. How long were you there? Ten days. Ten days. And in that time, there was a lot of prayer, prayer and preparation going before you arrived. And then when you were there, there was, there, there was a lot of prayer and preparation as well. So tell me, what is it that you saw God, do? What, what activity did you see, did you see God do? What, what is it that you, you, know, you would say, wow, I really saw God move in this area? Well, I really actually didn't see God in the work we were doing because we just showed up. We were doing one of the thousands of projects they okay. want us to do. And we can't do thousands in 10 days. So I more, more saw God saw God in the people that I was working next to. Right. Eric, Simon, and Paul, all locals to Nairobi. They've lived there their whole lives. And these guys, they're all of them are in their early to late 30s. And like Eric, Eric, he's a low-class citizen, makes 60 shillings or 60 cents an hour. And he has five kids and a wife at home. He, he said that the reason he doesn't complain when he works is because this job keeps bread on his table. Mm. I saw God in him because he, God is a hard worker. God works for us. He tries to give us the best. He gives us the best that he has to give us the best lives that we can have. And then I saw Simon. Simon was, <laughs> this guy was so simple. He was our laundry guy. He was the guy that did the impossible and cleaned our teenager, teenage rooms. You know, <coughs> messy, dirty clothes everywhere. Um, and he would just filled up our water bottles when we were working. Come by, hey, Lucas, you need your water bottle filled? I'm like, toss in my water bottle, and six minutes later, it'd be back at my, in my hands filled with water. He had a real servant's heart. Yeah. That's what he was, was the servant. And I saw God through him as a servant. God serves us. He brings us the best things. He worked for the best so that he could bring it to us on a silver platter. You know, that's, that's what I saw in Simon. And then there was um, Paul or Koyo. He preferred Koyo because that's his African name. But um, what he was, was he wasn't more of a servant. He wasn't a servant. He wasn't a worker. He was more of a brother. He was there when we needed him. There when we had a question. When, we, when I <laughs> needed to ask him, all right, so what's the project that I'm working on next? He'd give me a list of projects that I could do. And I was like, I choose that one. And he's like, okay, I'll be here when you need me. So, and I was like, okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll be here. <laughs> and um, he was more of a brother to me, right. a brother or a father figure. Right. So that's what I saw in God in him was the father figure, the father aspect of God. Cool. So, <clears throat> Lucas, just real quick, there, there's lots of people here today, and there's lots of people that maybe they've been on mission trips, maybe they haven't been on mission trips, but maybe God's kind of pulling on their heart. So let's just say that t today, right now, they're all sitting down and they're having a cup of coffee with you. And they were kind of wrestling with that call of God to, to do something. What is it that you would say to them? If it were me to say it, I would say follow where God tells you to go. If he tells you to go to Thailand, go to Thailand. If he tells you to go to Russia, into the deep Russia, you know, all the junk that's going on there, go there. That mean it's he's calling you there because there's something that he has for you. There's something that he wants to show you. So I would I would say go. Good, good. That <coughs> that's a good word, guys. Let's go ahead and let's pray for Lucas, and then um, and then we're going to go ahead and give you kind of a five minute break there, and then David's going to come up and he's going to share. So let let's go ahead and pray for Lucas. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, for Lucas. Thank you, Lord, for keeping him safe as he as he traveled, as he had an opportunity to serve, as he had an opportunity to watch you do great things in the lives of other people. And, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to ignite that fire inside of him, that, Lord, you would help him. This, this, is, this is a tender-hearted man. I've seen it more times than, than I can imagine. And, Lord, I am so proud of him. 
And I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would just continue to draw him, continue to call him, continue to move in him, and help him to be responsive to the things that you have for him. Please, God, be with his family as, as they watch these things happen. For, Lord, we ask this in your precious name. Amen. All right, guys. That's out of this room. All right. Good evening, everybody. Looks like break time is still, still on. Let me uh, introduce myself. My name is David, and this is Lale. So uh, I was going to introduce Lale a little bit later, but she wanted to be on the stage. And so, Lale, do you know what your name means? A flower. A flower. That's right. You know what flower? Lily? It's a tulip. The tulip lale. In the 10th century uh, BC, the Babylonians and the Persian Empire started cultivating tulips, and it was a very famous name. And today, if you go to uh, the modern day Persia or Iran, you will find many young women and old women, I guess. You'll find many ladies named lale. All right, lale, it's time for you to head back to your. Do you want to say, she wanted me to say that she loves, no, who, who loves candy corn? She loves candy corn. So there's no candy corn where we were living. So Lale. All right, join me tonight as we take a journey into the book of 1 John chapter 5. And it begins with, if you are are looking for 1 John, you go to the end of the New Testament and you go back a couple books and you will find the three books that John wrote there, the small books. And so we're going to be in chapter 5, which is the end of 1 John. 1 John 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. By this we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's our scripture for today. Let's, uh, let's pray together and commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as I come before you today, I ask that you would make much of yourself. Lord, I thank you that you are a loving God. And tonight, as we dive into that, I ask that you would help me to speak clearly, that you would open up the hearts and minds of the people here tonight, that we might celebrate what an awesome God you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I guess a belated happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed the time to be with family. I think being in America during Thanksgiving is uh, it's an exciting thing for us. We don't often get a chance to have turkey and dressing and uh, all the fixings and pumpkin pie. And so that was a great joy for us to be with our family. Uh, we went over to uh, Uncle Tom's house, Uncle Tom Gillahan's house. Uh, and uh, we were there talking with family. I think we did more laughing than talking. It's just a joy to fellowship with family. And when you're away for a long time, it really does warm your heart when you're there and you feel, again, part of the intimacy of fellowship with your own family. <clears throat> so about every four years, we get a chance to do a flyby here at Valley and at the EB. So I get a chance to come in and kind of share with you what the Lord is doing around the world. And today we're going to uh, do a little bit of that. And mostly we're just going to look at God's love and what that means here in John. Now we're connected. I already said we're connected to the Gilhans. We're connected to the end bodies. We're connected to the Randolphs. We're connected to uh, the Del Gardnos. Uh, We're connected to a lot of people here in Longview. And so this has become our home. And I was telling, I was at the Northwest Baptist Convention and just sharing with people that we had a chance. My wife is from Longview, and I'm married into Longview. So this is now my home. It's the, 
I think I've only come and spent a little bit of time here, but I've really begun to enjoy uh, this little corner of the world. And it started raining, and I anticipate that it will keep raining. Uh, it was beautiful summer, and it was hot, and there was lots of fire, and there was, it was a little scary with all the smoke. Uh, we had an eclipse that we were able to see, and we are going to be here in Longview until July 2018. So we have a nice long time to enjoy being here, our family, the kids are going to school. And, you know, there's something about our family, just as I introduced them, I thought I would share with you kind of how I pray and how this week I've specifically prayed over each member of my family. And, of course, I pray for them because I love them. Kara is a Greek word that means joy. And I thank God for her, and I've been praying Psalms 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with song I praise him. And when I think of Kara, my heart leaps with joy. She is a shield of faith for our family. I have two boys and two girls. There's one right there in the hat and the long curly hair. That's Isaiah. We have another son that's at home doing a homework project. Uh, he'll come with us tomorrow as we visit the other campuses here. Uh, Wesley means westward meadow. Go west, young man. Uh, and my prayer for him, and it has been my prayer for him since he was born, is John 15, 5. Abide in me and I in you, as the branches cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. That's been my prayer over Wesley, that he would abide and know Jesus, that he would walk with Jesus. Isaiah, your name means Yahweh is our salvation. It has a very close connection to the name Jesus. My prayer over you, Isaiah, is Revelation 7.10. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is on the throne, and to the Lamb. That's something I always want you to champion, that salvation begins and ends with our God. Selah means a praise or a pause, and she's our first daughter. It means a reflection to say it is good. When God created the world and he paused, he looked at everything and said, it is good. Uh, this particular word has been adopted by the Rastafarians, and it means word up. So they say, Selah, bro, or something like that. Um, my prayer or dedication over Selah has been Psalms 3.8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. We've already dived a little bit into Lale's name, and uh, the, the scripture I've had over her comes from Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Each of those verses are uniquely picked because of the personalities that each of my children have. I love my family. If put to the test, I will cross deserts. I will climb mountains. I will defend them to the death. And I'm sure you will do the same for your family. When I first went to college in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Kara was in Jackson, Tennessee, I remember being obsessed. Uh, clearly, I was out of my mind, insanely in love with that woman right there. I did everything I could to be in close proximity to her. I had one singular intent, make sure that I am around her, because being around her was intoxicating. It felt great just to be in proximity. That hasn't changed, by the way. Um, love is the most powerful human emotion that I have ever experienced. We have a primal drive, a desire to love and to be loved. It is stamped into our very being. Over time, my love for my wife has deepened because it's gone beyond hormones. It's gone beyond relational need for love. It's gone beyond the need for life partner. It has gone beyond my wildest imaginations. 
or imagination. Today, the love I have for my wife and my family has been forged and deepened by the Holy Spirit. It has been informed by the Word of God over these last 17 years. Today, I know love is commitment. Love is enduring. It gets richer with time. Love compels me to action. Today, I'm going to jump into Lance's sermon series on love. Love is all you need. You know, that brings up a movie. I think Moulin Rouge. Love is all you need, but we won't sing that for you today. Um, together we have looked, or together we have looked at how love is sacrificial. God was driven by love to sacrifice his son. Then we looked at how love is healing. Through his sacrifice, we find healing from our brokenness. Today we're going to look at how love is compelling. God's miraculous healing, his redemption and forgiveness compels us to love him in faith and obedience. As we launch into this topic, let me outline a few things for you. I'm going to put three things in front of you. The first one is we're going to look at God's attributes briefly. We're going to look at John and his writings. And then we're going to look at specifically where this teaching today fits in the broader biblical narrative. When we list list the attributes of God, there are many of them. God's love, I believe that the Bible teaches that all the attributes of God are perfectly working together all the time. When we talk about God's attributes, we are talking about those things that make God who he is. We list these characteristics according to what we find in Scripture so that we can understand who he truly is. We could quickly list these 16 characteristics, things like God's eternality, God's goodness, God's grace, God's holiness, God's mercy, God's righteousness. And today we're focusing on the attribute of God's love. Wayne Grudem is one of my go-to theologians. I am not a theologian, and I'm glad that God has gifted some men to write eloquently. So uh, Dr. Grudem wrote a systematic or a, a systemization of the study of God. And in there he writes, God is not divided into parts. Yet, we see different attributes of God emphasized at different times. We must remember that God's whole being includes all of his attributes. He is entirely loving, entirely merciful, entirely just, and so forth. Every attribute of God that we find in the scripture is true of God's being, and therefore we can say that every attribute of God qualifies every other attribute. Simply said, God is perfect. Who he is and what he has done, or who he is and what he does, never diminishes his own character. There are no contradictions in God. John and his writings, in first part, God's attributes. So now we're going to do the second part here is talking about John and his writings. The disciple John writes about love in the Gospel of John. We see that in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he writes about love, and then he writes about the result of love in Revelation. This man was driven by love. He calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, this statement isn't to be a comparison. It's a declaration. Jesus had a personal love for people. He is the brother of James, another disciple that Jesus called. He and Peter are sent ahead of everyone else to prepare the Passover meal in Jerusalem. He sits beside Jesus right beside Jesus, intimately, close beside Jesus at the Passover meal. He is the only disciple mentioned to be present, or he himself claims to be present at the crucifixion. Every other gospel lists that the disciples scattered. And John, he was there. Jesus gives John charge over Mary, his mother, Peter and John go running to the empty tomb. The ladies are the first ones there. And then they call the men, and Peter and John go take, you know, they take off to go see. Is the tomb really empty? John becomes an elder at the church of Ephesus. That's actually the next time we really get a, a picture of John. We don't see him throughout kind of 
he, he gets lost in, in some of the narrative. We, we see a, a hero emerge of Peter, who's, who's kind of a hero of the Jerusalem church, and uh, rightly so. And the next thing we see is, is Paul. But John, he wrote a lot and was very, very influential. And we see that he had a huge influence in Ephesus. He ends up in Rome at the Colosseum to be deep fried, to be put to death by being boiled alive in oil. That's a pretty gruesome way to go. But what happens? We know from uh, early church history that God protects him in a dramatic fashion. That the whole, the tradition states that the whole Colosseum, now you guys know the size of the Colosseum, right? They see a man and they have come to celebrate death. And they see a miracle of God. John is miraculously saved. And so the Caesar at that time decides, I need to take this guy and get rid of him. So he sends him to Patmos, the island of exile. A volcanic island, kind of off the coast. Maybe he'll have less influence there. And this is where John gets the revelation that we know, now know is the book of Revelation. He writes to seven existing churches. That Caesar dies, and he returns from exile. He goes back to Ephesus, and there he dies a ripe old age. Today we can go to his tomb, or at least the historic location of his tomb, to the monastery that is there, to the big cathedral. I saw a picture of it. It's up on a hill. It's beautiful. He writes a firsthand eyewitness account of the life and ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of John for the purpose, he states in John 20, 30 through 31, for the purpose of persuading people that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that they and that by believing this, they might have eternal life in his name. His writings focus on the perfect deity and humanity of Jesus. Jesus as all God and all man as the perfect Savior, the one and only. First John is a theological argument. So the, we've got the Gospel of John that he writes. We've got First John is basically a theological paper on the deity and the humanity of Christ. And then we've got 2nd and 3rd John that go on to talk specifically. Uh, they are taking a, a position on hospitality. They are pointing out false teachings. And they are talking about the divisions in the church. So, why do I spend all this time talking, going into detail, and giving you guys a history lesson on the writings in the New Testament? Because it's very important that... I don't mess up a teaching by giving you something, a little tidbit, without showing you where it fits in the bigger narrative. So I want to make sure that I, my goal is to ensure that I get the teaching right. I get the teaching right for when it was written, who it was written to, and I get it right for us today. So now to the body of the sermon. We'll go to God's love is compelling, the miraculous healing of God. What is the miraculous healing of God? It is his redemption and forgiveness. That compels us to love him and his glory. Today we're going to explore five verses. The first verse here, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the child as well. This is kind of the first section Love compels us to faith. We believe in the true Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, perfectly appointed as an anointing sacrifice or as the atoning sacrifice for sin. Atonement means to make amends or to pay for, to clear the slate. Jesus makes amends for our sin problem. Only Jesus is able to be our sacrifice because he did it as God, and he did it as man. Everyone, who is this available to? Understanding that faith is available to everyone. Belief is available to everyone. Everyone means everyone. Everyone who confesses that Jesus is Lord. The second part of this sentence is a fact statement about those who believe. Evidence of this belief is everyone who loves the Father will also love those the Father has adopted as children. 
We who believe are the children of God, and confirmation of this is how we love one another. Now, we get an opportunity to do this tonight. We get an opportunity when we come together to love one another. How we love one another in times of transition, in times of stress, in times when things are not going well, that speaks volumes about what we believe. The second verse, second and third verse, really can be titled, Love Compels Us to Obedience. This one was very interesting to me because it, it's a personal journey of mine. There's two ways that this verse talks about obedience. First, it says to carry out, how do we know that we love God? We carry out his commands. And then secondly, how do we know we love God? We keep them. So as I go into this a little bit further, let me tell you a story about my childhood. As a boy, our family had rules. Rules that sounded like this. Things like, David, do not throw rocks at cars that drive past the house. In my defense, it wasn't a rock. It was a firecracker. I got in huge trouble for that one. And it was like, yeah, tattooed onto me that do not do that. Secondly, do not set the field in front of the house on fire. Now, in my defense, it was tradition in the local farming community there to burn off the field at least once a year. And I thought... It's time to burn the field. It was great fun to throw matches at the bamboo pile behind the house. That was also a no-no. Uh, probably my favorite David do not rule was if you climb a tree, do not call for help. I spent many long hours standing or stranded on top of trees. Now, in my defense, I believe that God created trees so that we could climb them. But lots of hours spent trying to figure out how I get down. Our house in Africa, where I grew up, had lots of trees. And so that was kind of the thing to do. Now, there were, there were other kind of commandment-type rules that our family lived by. Every guest was to be served tea. If you were to come to my house, the very first thing we would do is we would sit you down. We would not ask you. Uh, it would not be, would you like some tea? You're getting tea. At our, at our house. And that came with uh, something. Now, my mom, when she went to Africa and served there as a missionary's wife, as a missionary herself, as a pastor's wife, she did not realize the kind of hospitality that would be expected of her. And so, not only tea would you, you were expected to provide tea, but you also respected, uh, uh, that you were expected to provide something to eat, something sweet. Something beautiful, something my mom just like cake. I'm going to cut you a piece of cake. Here you go. So we worked on that a lot in our home, getting desserts ready for whenever guests arrived. Hospitality, we, uh, we planned our meals. The main meal that we were going to have for the day always revolved around who and when people were coming to our house. So if we had people who spent the night, the main meal of the day would be breakfast because hospitality was really important to my parents. We wanted people to know that they were loved. And so fellowship and hospitality were huge kind of rules, commandments. Um, the first set of rules were do not do. The second set of rules, the commandments, were these are the things that happen in my house. The one was... Be careful to keep what I tell you. And the other one is these are the things that we carry out. So if we go back to what John is saying here. John is trying to help us understand that there, there is a specific way that we love God. The first one there in the NIV uh, talks about carrying out. But another way to say carry out is obey. Uh, I do not know Greek, but in my brief study this past week, it was very interesting to see that that word is a very strong to make happen type word. Later on in the next verse, we see to keep, to guard, to treasure. 
That's the second way that we can keep his commandments, how we show that we love God. Now, there came a conflict. And uh, I'll level with you, and, and I'll be honest, that really in the privacy of my own heart, there's a struggle. And it, it's because in my mind I was thinking if salvation is only about saving, if it's only about saving sinners, why doesn't God just save me and take me? Right? The whole point is like I lived a life of sin. When I profess Christ as Lord and Savior, I thought that I had arrived at the pinnacle of my Christian experience. If any of you have come to faith as adults, if you have lived life and you have been burned badly by sin, there is nothing quite like the moment that you understand the love of God for you. It rocks your world. Being born again, having my spiritual eyes open to the reality of my desperate need for Jesus. Jesus can fix my sin problem, my death problem. I began to wonder, is that the ultimate? I began to think that it was. As the days and weeks passed, I was surprised that I still had an appetite for sin. I mean, knowing God knowing what Jesus has done for you, knowing that his death on the cross paid for that sin. Now, I struggle with the sin appetite that I thought somehow I would have a leg up on, that I would be more triumphant, that the temptation would be easier to deal with. So, I began a battle between my born-again spirit and my sinful flesh. As a young man, I tried everything to deal with this. I tried to make up my own way of battling with sin. I was pursuing, I was searching for the right life formula that would give me victory over my sin issues. As the years passed, I started to feel defeated. Fake I was completely spent. All my energy, all my hope that I would conquer this was gone. I was hopeless. I felt helpless. My own effort had resulted in defeat. I was utterly discouraged and disillusioned. I felt a kind of weird betrayal. I felt like Christ had given me hope and slowly... I had killed that hope with my disobedience and sin. I, we have an impossible task. We have the task of obedience. That's what we're called. If you love God, you will obey him. Wow. This is like huge heart struggle for me. Now, all is not lost. It did come. I know that sounds pretty dark. And, and actually, I hope it tapped into something that you have thought about, that you have struggled with. As you battle with sin, it's easy to focus on sin. But I did not stop there. The answer to my struggle is in the Word of God, and the answer that God's Word gives is pretty awesome. I would like to tell you that I discovered this all on my own, but no. I needed help. I needed to learn from God's word through God's Holy Spirit. And this journey of learning has come through several people. God has gifted some people to teach God's word clearly. John Piper is such a teacher. What I'm going to share with you comes from his book, What Jesus Demands of the World. And I would challenge, if this is something that's on your heart and you really want to dive into what are the commands of Jesus, John, Dr. Piper, can take you on, on a, a beautiful journey of discovery and victory. 
John writes in his book, as an introduction here, uh, he says, So the greatest challenge in writing this book for him was to discern God's way of making the impossible obedience possible. Jesus said that the impossible goal happens through teaching. Make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's teaching for outcomes. If any of you are teachers or you've been in school, you know, we're, we're not teaching for you to be a parrot and that you can just regurgitate information. We're teaching that you will have a life outcome change. There is, of course, more to it than just simply teaching the commands of Christ when it comes to the Christian life. Like the atoning death of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit and prayer, But in the end, Jesus focuses on teaching. I take this to mean that God has chosen to do the impossible through the teaching of all that Jesus has commanded. Now, John Piper, I'm still reading from John Piper's work here. The ultimate goal of Jesus' commandments is not that we observe them by doing good works. The ultimate goal is that God be glorified. The obedience of good works is penultimate. I had to look that one up. Penultimate, not quite ultimate. But what is ultimate is that in our obedient lives, God is displayed as the most beautiful reality in the world. That is, Jesus, his ultimate goal is God's glory, and it is mine. John Piper helps me see that Scripture is always pointing us back to the ultimate. The ultimate in all creation is the glory of God. This realization comes from learning from God's Word and not letting my own ideas drive my understanding of a redeemed reality. Let me, let me repeat that. This realization came from learning from God's Word and not letting my own idea shape how I thought about my new reality in Christ. The ultimate is not David's effort to conquer sin, right? Christ created us to be driven by love. The answer to my sin problem isn't sin management for my own glory. So somehow I can say, great, look at what I have accomplished. I killed sin. I tried that. And I was very unsuccessful. The answer to my sin problem is to love God. To tap into the most powerful motivation that I have access to. To love God and His glory above all else. Right here today, we have a clear way of being obedient. Today, my sharing of God's word is an expression of love for you. I've taken the time... And poured over this, and I've, I've been careful with it, and I have earnestly worked hard to produce something that I would bring before you so together. This can be an expression of the glory of God. Today, right now, I'm being obedient. I am loving the children of God, the church. I am loving you through this teaching. And today, as the church... We are the radiance of God's glory. That's pretty awesome. When the world looks at the church, I think that they see the glory of God. That should be our goal. That's my ultimate goal. Whenever I'm preaching or teaching or when I'm sharing or when I'm discipling or when I'm being a part of the body of Christ. So there are three things here. Love leads or love compels us to faith. Love compels us to obedience, and love leads to a victory over the world. Love conquers sin. Love wins. The world is overcome. We are victorious. The world is conquered by what? It is conquered by faith in Christ. The world of sin and death has no defense against love. There is no defense in Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, animism, And I speak from experience. I've spent time in all of these places where these religions are dominant. Secularism, hedonism, 
does not have any place, does not have any defense against love. Why? Because love crosses great distances. Love breaks down barriers. Heart connection with people. We talk about bridging to the gospel. That's a lot of our work is we're talking, how do I go? How do I bridge to the gospel? Earlier, I shared with you the names of my children. Took a long time, and it felt like, well, where does he go? Where is he going to? That is my bridge to people. I say, this is what I love. Let me tell you about my kids. And, it, and I, it, I want to tie it so closely to the word of God that I have an opportunity to share my faith in Jesus Christ with people when I share the names of my family because names are important. And the most important name of all is Jesus Christ. I want to share with you a great love story for the nations. A giant of the faith, a woman named Charlotte D. You already know who Charlotte D is? Charlotte D, she was not like, she was not unlike many of our children. She loved a good prank and sugar cookies. Uh, When she was sent to boarding school, she hated the 6 a.m. morning bell. So she woke up in the middle of the night. She went, tied blankets and straw into the bell so that when she woke up and they tried to ring the bell, there would be no sound. Yeah, she's a lady after my own heart. Anyway, that happened to cause quite a stir. At 18, she found love in the gospel. She found forgiveness, redemption, and victory. She showed her love for God by going to the nations. She spent 40 years in China making disciples, teaching and baking sugar cookies. She died with very few of her teeth left in her mouth because of poor hygiene and poor access to to toothpaste and other things. She gave her life for the sake of the gospel. She, in my mind, Charlotte D, is known as Charlotte D, or Lottie Moon. And I actually had my daughter up here. My daughter is four foot tall, and uh, Sela is four foot five. Lottie would have stood all of four foot two inches. A giant of the faith. She loved in an amazing way. Because she wrote letters back. Back to the foreign board at that time. And now we call it the International Mission Board. She wrote letters. And her letters over time said, please, please send Finance, send support so that we continue to take the gospel further and further out. And so, in Arkansas, Annie Armstrong took up the first Lottie Moon Christmas offering. They exceeded their their, uh, budgeted amount that they kind of set a goal. They exceeded it by 150%. And this is a long time ago. And it was all driven by love. Lottie knew what the victory is. She understood that Jesus overcomes the world. I just said Jesus overcomes, but let me say it again. Jesus has overcome the world. He is victorious. He is victorious in our lives, and he is victorious in the world. 1 John 4, 15 through 17. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This is how, we, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In the world, we are like Jesus. As we focus on loving God, we will have a joyful obedience. We are divinely enabled to love God through the gospel. We love God in our profession of faith. We love God in our participation in the work of the gospel, both personally and corporately as a church. We love God as we carry out the work of the gospel to the nations. The work of the gospel is to be the witness to everyone, everywhere, with the good news that Jesus wins. This is Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. It's a way of demonstrating our love for God. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations and teach them to obey 
here in Matthew, he couches the Great Commission with two things. He couches the Great Commission with authority, and the second part is he, ca- he says, I'm going with you. So we are sent out, and we have the confidence to go out because he is with us. Now, I spent and looked through time and scripture, and uh, I want to bring us to a point of understanding that God truly cares about our response to him. And so tonight, if you are hearing some things that resonate with you, tonight we heard from Lucas, who talked about going on short term. You're hearing from me, who has definitely decided that the way I'm going to love God and to serve him is by going to the nations. But how about you? If we take time to really think, if you look on your table, there's a pamphlet there. There should be a fire in our bones as the people of God to pray for the nations. Perhaps tonight is a time in which you want to take time to be a prayer warrior. Oliver Stanley, one of my great friends, a couple weeks ago, he, he, I sat in his home and he, w- he broke down and he said, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is calling me to be your lifelong prayer warrior. That was powerful. And he has been earnestly for many years he has prayed for me. It's the spiritual work of God that we have access to, to pray. The second thing that I think as a church, we need to look at what is the church? How much is the church looking to say, does our budget reflect our desire for the nations? Are we setting ourselves a goal that stretches us, that asks us to go beyond? You know, love doesn't ask the question, how far is far enough? Love isn't something that that sets boundaries and limits. Love calls us to go far above and beyond. So my prayer for you tonight as we conclude this is that love will compel you to faith. Secondly, love will compel you to obedience. And finally, let us all celebrate that love is victorious. Let's pray together. Lord, I come before you and I'm going to pray from the Psalms. May the praises of our God come from every nation. May all people everywhere worship you, Lord, for great is your steadfast love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praised be the name of the Lord. Oh, let us here tonight at the electric bean give thanks to God for, for you are good. For your steadfast love endures forever. Let the people of God, let the church of God say, your steadfast love endures forever. Lord, tonight I conclude my worship to you my expression of love for your glory and this acknowledgement that while I was yet a sinner, you loved me and you saved me. Teach me to love you more. Teach me to love your people better. For yours is the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen.